right, John, welcome to the show. Um, for anybody that isn't aware of you and the work that you do, could you tell us a bit about your background and what got you so interested in studying the, the meaning crisis? Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, I guess, first of all, sort of my professional background, I'm a, an associate professor at the University of Toronto. I teach and do research in cognitive psychology, where I do a lot of work on wisdom, rationality, and uh, intelligence and, and mindfulness. And I also teach within the cognitive science program. I'm the director of the cognitive science program, where I do a lot of work on um, the nature of intelligence, but more from a neuroscientific uh, point of view. Um, and this process of meaning making that I call relevance realization. Uh, and then I also teach in an overload uh, program, the Buddhism and cognitive, uh, the Buddhism psychology and mental health program, where I teach a course on uh, Buddhism and cognitive science. I do work on mindfulness, transformative experience, and enlightenment. So uh, the three overlapping areas, they, they, they may sound very discordant, but they actually are really uh, coherent and they mutually afford and support each other. Um, and so I went, I don't know how much of my personal biography you want, but basically, um, like, like many other people, I went through something of a personal meaning crisis uh, that had to do with leaving the religion I was brought up in and then searching around. Um, I encountered uh, the figure of Socrates, that, and this has started a lifelong relationship for me um, in which the cultivation of wisdom came to the fore. Uh, and this was initially very intuitive and, and incoate for me, but this was the primary thing that was needed to respond to my personal meaning crisis. And then as I did more and more work on that, I also took up a whole ecology of practices, meditation, contemplation, uh, Tai Chi Chuan, uh, 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 of uh, Qigong, uh, Yichuan, just a whole bunch of them. Um, and then eventually some uh, related Neoplatonic practices like Lexio Divina and things like that. And so I was doing all of that and I started to bring connections between my personal response to the meaning crisis and the, and the sort of cutting edge cognitive science that I was seeing. And this new model of cognitive science was really awakening uh, uh, to aspects of the mind and the mind's relationship to the body and the mind and body's relationship to other people and to the world that had been largely very neglected until very recently within cognitive science. So the cognitive science was emerging and it was starting to provide me with all this language and discourse for reflecting upon and articulating what the personal transformation I was going through. And I started to share this in my courses, uh, my, both my psychology courses and my cog sci courses. And the students really started to respond very deeply. And so I started to suspect that there was more going on than just my personal, right? And we always overgeneralize from ourselves. So I was worried about that, but I was getting more. And so the more I, I like, I, very, I think I was like the first person to teach about mindfulness at the University of Toronto. But the more I sort of unpacked this uh, stuff that was previously considered sort of granola and woo woo and, and show how it could be approached in a really rigorous manner, both theoretically and empirically, the more the students were eating it up. And then my, my colleague and friend, Evan Thompson, was at U of T at the time, and they asked him to teach this course, Buddhism and Cognitive Science. And he said, I can't do it, but John would be perfect for it. So I started teaching it. And I even in, in that course, I even more started uh, to open this up. And as I, start, as I saw the, the increasing response from the students, um, uh, that course quickly became, in some sense, my summative course, my most favorite course, and it was, became extremely uh, popular. Um, and so I got more and more interested in the meaning crisis, not just as I had found it from the inside personally. And I started, I started doing a lot of the history, um, the influence of Mark Taylor and Charles Taylor and a whole bunch of other people. And I'd always been an amateur historian. And so I just opened that up and I poured more on that. So I did that for like a decade, um, really developing that. And one of my students, uh, I, I'd sort of filmed one version of it, but it was really crappy and horrible and the sound, like just so I had it online for my students because if they missed a lecture. And I had a student who, 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 like he was done the course and everything and he came up to me and he said, you know, I'm a professional videographer. My father's a professional editor. Let's turn this into, let's turn, take this and do a really good job. Um, and that's, so how, that's how the Awakening the Meaning Crisis came about. 
I took all the work from Buddhism and cognitive science. Of course, I teach on the psychology of wisdom. Of course, I taught on the psychology of mindfulness. Of course, I taught on the psychology of insight um, and, about, and all this other work. And I put it all together and made the argument for awakening from the meaning crisis. So, and then since then, I have, I mean, I've made other smaller series more of in-house. I've done, I've done a series called Untangling the World Knot with Greg Enriquez, in which we really try to wrestle with, from a cognitive science point of view, what is consciousness? What kind of thing is it? How does it emerge? How does it work? Um, and I'm going to be doing another one with Greg and uh, my good friend and co-author, Christopher Matria, Master Pietro on the nature of the self. Um, that's coming out shortly. Um, and then I've been doing Voices with Raveki because I've been very interested in trying to tap into the collective intelligence of, right, of distributed cognition, not individual cognition, but the cognition that we do in groups, the way the internet networks computers together, culture networks people together, and trying to tap into that. And so I've been doing participant observation, entering into these deep dialogues that often transform into what I call dialogos, where the two of us are coming to a place together that we couldn't come to individually, um, almost sort of a shared flow state that's directed towards um, communing in the communication, not just stating ideas and exemplifying that and, and how that can be something that people need, that sense of connectedness, deep opening connectedness as something that they need in order to respond to the meaning crisis. So um, I'm doing that now. It's a series called Voices with Raveki. I've got an anthology that Chris and I have put together from many people who are setting up all these different ecologies and practices around this authentic dialogue. They're, they're springing up all over the place and we, we got them together and we put a, an anthology together. And so that's sort of what I'm working on right now. And that, that's sort of me in a nutshell, I hope. I hope that was, I hope that was helpful. That's fantastic. It sounds like you're very busy anyway. Um, I'd be curious to ask, John, you know, what would you say are the symptoms or the evidence that we are currently experiencing a meaning crisis in our culture? And I know you've read a book, I can't remember the exact title, but the metaphor you use is zombies. Now, why did yeah. you choose that particular metaphor? That's excellent. So yeah, it's zombies in Western culture, a 21st century crisis. I wrote that with Christopher Massapietro and Philip Misovic. Um, so the, let, I'll come back to the zombies because it's a, it's another symptom. It's a, it's a sort of a mythopoetic symptom. Um, and cultures often express distress by generating mythological imagery. Um, and there's a set of mythemes that are really powerful right now. But before we get to that, let's think, because Chris and I have published in a, a journal called The Side View, um, an overview of what we call the symptomology of the meaning crisis and sort of the, the set of things you can see happening. And, th and there's a whole bunch of them. Um, one is just the, I mean, and, and, and sort of the response to the meaning crisis itself is evidence of this, right? The, the pervasive sense of sort of nihilism and cynicism uh, that's pervasive in the culture. And we have to understand that that sense of meaninglessness is, uh, there was a, it's really quite profound. There was a survey recently, I think it was 2017 in the UK and 89% of the people responded and said their lives were meaningless. Um, the older people did a bit better uh, they were only something like, I can't remember if this is exactly right, it's like 60% um, were meaningless. And, and that's because some of them have the sense of meaninglessness ameliorated by religion. Um, I'm not proposing religion, but there's, a, there's an important thing to take note of there. Religion networks people together, like I was talking about earlier, and gets that sort of communal flow and connectedness. Uh, we can come back to that later. Uh, but so that sense of meaninglessness can directly lead to suicide, e even without triggering clinical depression. Of course, it overlaps with clinical depression and anxiety disorders, which are on the rise now in a very significant way, especially among younger people. That's of course, um, is exacerbated by another thing that's, you know, really um, a, both the symptom and an accelerant of the meaning crisis, which is people's um, almost addictive behavior to social media, uh, and they keep craving more and more. Um, and it's not satisfying them in a healthy manner. So they either fall into despair or they fall into craziness. Uh, you know, the, the, the rise of what Jules Evans calls conspirituality, um, the attempt to find an underlying, they're so hungry for an underlying narrative 
that makes their lives meaningful, that's a clear symptom. On the other hand, like I said, people give up and, and you find this pervasive and growing at a time of such expensive social media. And this is before COVID, by the way, uh, it's accelerated by COVID, but this is the loneliness epidemic. People overwhelmingly seem to be much more lonely uh, than they used to be, disconnected. You have the disenfranchisement. People are leaving established religions and organized religions in ever increasing numbers. The nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, right, is, was a fastest growing um, demographic group. But if you look at them, they're not sort of Sam Harris atheists. Most of them are spiritual, but not religious, which is they hunger for, uh, and this term is very vague and almost useless, they hunger for spirituality, uh, but they're really distrustful of both political ideologies and organized religions. And so they do this autodidactic fragmented thing. Uh, you see the rise of a lot of, well, it's, 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 it's very much like religious behavior uh, around mythological figures. Um, and so on one side, you've got, right, we, ha we had the whole big thing. I mean, it's waning because it was just an expression. It wasn't a, a, a solution. But the whole zombie metaphor, right, the myth theme, and people really getting so invested in it. And, you know, the zombie really represents the meaning crisis, uh, the, the, right? The, the, uh, they, 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 they can't make meaning. They, they can't even speak. They often hunger for the meaning making or organ. They want to eat brains. What a bizarre thing, right? Uh, they move around in a horde, but there's no community or connection. They're perpetually decadent and decaying. Uh, they eat, but they're never satisfied, right? They drift aimlessly. There's no grand purpose. They're not even metaphysically evil. They're just us. I mean, and that was something that was hammered home in uh, The Walking Dead. We are The Walking Dead. The, the heroes say that m multiple times in the in the series. It's like, yes, we are, right? And we shuffle down the streets, right? And like all that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and the zombie also represents the perversion of the Christian mythos. Uh, the zombie is resurrected, but not to the abundant life, but to the decadent life, right? Um, and the zombie is associated with an apocalypse. The apocalypse was supposed to be the renewal of the world, but that's perverted into the just ongoing, pervasive, unending, right? There isn't even a story there, it just drifts. So that's one side, but you see, I don't know if this is positive or not, but not as, uh, but not as I don't know, negative, I guess. Um, you know, the, just the titanic fascination with superheroes uh, and the mythos of people who are empowered that they have special powers and special connections to reality such that they can do the morally good thing and build meaningful projects. And so people are just hungry for that. And then you see more positive. Uh, and by the way, that's religious. And if you don't think that's religious, go to Comic-Con sometime. If you don't think that's religious, go to Comic-Con sometime. I mean, I w you know, the churches would love it if they could get that kind of Oh, I'm, I'm not religious. What, what are you doing? Well, I'm dressing up as Thor and I'm going to go to this place where other people are dressed up and we're going to walk around and we're going to buy objects and do things together and perform rituals and celebrate the... Yeah, that's religion, right? And that often pisses people off when I say that. But you also get more positive things. You have the mindfulness revolution that's been going on. You have the revival of ancient practices for cultivating wisdom like stoicism. You have a massive increase in the academic interest on mindfulness, transformative experiences, psychedelic experiences, mystical experiences, and wisdom, meaning in life. This is just burgeoning. Um, and so you see all of the, what, what explains all of these phenomena, right? Well, we think what explains it is there's something like, what, we're, all, what makes sense of all of those together collectively is the, Christ, the culture, people are starving for meaning. Now, when we say meaning, we're using a metaphor. We, sent, sentences or utterances have meaning. We're, we're, we're using it as a metaphor for, well, sentences make sense and they connect us and the world together in an effective manner. <clears throat> and what people are saying with that metaphor is they want their lives and their, and their states of awareness to, to make sense in such a way that they feel deeply connected to themselves, to each other in the world. And for, for a lot of people, that's not gelling as well as it should. And we know that meaning in life is a real need. Like if you don't have meaning in life, it impacts you, all your mental and physical health in pretty, uh, pretty important ways. So that's sort of all of the evidence 
for the meeting crisis in a nutshell, I hope. <laughs> read, the, read the article, if any, I mean, and people should. If people are critical and want to disagree, read the article uh, because we go into it obviously in more detail with more argumentation. Cool. We'll link to the, what's the name of the article? We'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, I'll send you the link. I'm trying to remember what it is. Uh, what, what do we call, I think it's called the symptomology of the meaning crisis. It's in okay. a journal called the side view. If you want, I'll send you a bunch, bunch of links to all these things. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. Um, so in your series, I think, I'm not sure the exact amount there's, is there 50 lectures, 50 plus lectures? Yeah, there's 50 lectures and it's divided evenly. The first 25 lectures while having a lot of cognitive science in them are basically the historical argument. How did we get here historically? And then the second right half of the, of uh, the lecture series is the cognitive science. Well, what is this meaning making? And, and why are people so hungry for meaning and wisdom? What's it do? How does it work, et cetera? That, that's what I wanted to ask you about, you know, um, obviously there's 25 lectures on the historical context around this, um, but if maybe you could provide like a bit of an introduction and to say, what would you think are the primary historical causes at the root of the current meaning crisis that we're experiencing, you know, like, um, what would you say it's rooted in? Um, so, so very broadly, sort of, sort of two, two main things. Uh, this is, yeah, I mean, forgive me, and, and I know you'll take it, take it charitably. I have to try and summarize uh, a 25 hour argument into um, maybe five minutes. Um, so, um, so one thing to note is that our sense of wisdom, it has a legacy, it's a heritage. It's, uh, and that heritage has been developed and been enculturated, so, sewn into the fabric of our culture. Um, and so there's a period, some people call, uh, call it the axial revolution, some people call it the axial age, some people call it the axial sta stage. And I'm not gonna get into that historical controversy, but basically there was the bronze age, which is uh, you know ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, lasts a long time, great huge empires. And then there's the greatest collapse in civilization that's ever occurred, the Bronze Age collapse. And there's also a lot of controversy around what was happening there or why did it happen? But the point is, uh, I, I use an analogy to try and help people. So the, the Bronze Age is filled with these dinosaur empires and these dinosaur cultures. And then the Bronze Age collapses like the asteroid hitting the earth 65 million years ago. And the mammals that had existed for 130 million years and without changing much, they, they, they then go through this massive process of differentiation, of speciation. And so the Bronze Age collapses like the asteroid hitting, and then all these little kingdoms and new cultures spring up. And they invent, they invent a bunch of psychotechnologies. Psychotechnology is a tool designed to sort of fit the mind and enhance it. So they invent alphabetic literacy, and then the Greeks do things like add vowels and standardize the reading. Uh, they invent coinage, which teaches people numeracy and to use abstract symbol system. The thing is, these, these psychotechnologies are created for very sort of prosaic reasons. Uh, and there's other things going on. So I'm just trying to be very fast. So, sorry to interrupt you on. One of the things I found really interesting was um, the origin of phrases such as like, how are you? Like when we walk past on the street and we say like, you know, how are you? Like why we do that? And yeah, I find that absolutely fascinating. So maybe can you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, uh, which do you mean? Sorry, I, I'm, I'm, uh, what, what, what connection are you asking? So, you know, you're talking about these psychotechnologies and ways sort of our, our, our cultures have evolved out of this axial revolution. And one of the things you were saying was that um, whenever we see each other in the street, we'll walk past casually and we'll say things like, like, how are you or how's it going today? And you were saying in the lecture series that this is kind of like a psychotechnology for helping us to develop a third person perspective and take yes, the perspective of yes, another person. Yes, which is trade. Yeah, yeah that, right. That, yeah, right, I'm, see, I'm seeing the connection now. I, I was trying to see what was the connection was to the actual age, but you were making a connection to psychotechnology. Yeah, exactly. We, we have all these practices. We have all these standardized ways of communicating uh, information or storing information or transmitting information uh, that, are, yeah, that are designed to, again, fit our cognition, fit our behavior, and, and, and um, achieve certain very prosaic goals. Like, how are you, which is basically right, a, a way of opening ourselves up to there's other people, there's other perspectives. We don't want too much of an answer from other people, but we want to right, constantly remind ourselves, as you said, that there's a third person perspective uh, and we want to give the person the chance to 
uh, you know, have our attention for a little bit. And so, yeah, we, and that's very, that, that's a practice that we do that sort of takes the place of the way, you know, primates groom each other and, and pick lice off of each other. That's sort of us doing that socially. Yeah, the, the psychotechnologies are, are, are pervasive uh, and we don't notice them because the tools have, we, we have become so internalized to us that they become part of us. But, but that's, that was the point. So to return to the, what's happening in the actual age, You've got people internalizing alphabetic literacy. Imagine if I took alphabetic literacy away from you. You couldn't do most of the things you do. Imagine if I took numeracy away from you. Imagine if I took abstract symbolic thought away from you, right? See how much they empower your cognition and how much they connect you to other people's cognition. Like, how are you? They connect us in powerful ways. Mm. Now these, these psychotechnologies are originally created for, like I said, for very prosaic reasons, but they really empower people and they really connect them and they're deeply internalized. And so people start applying, as you would expect them to, these psychotechnologies more broadly. They start to apply them to their own minds, to their own cognition, because notice how much, how much just think about the fact that you can write your thoughts down, how much more self-aware you become of that. Mm. Right. The fact that you can calculate and follow rules makes you aware of many times where your thinking isn't being rigorous, isn't following rules. Right. So you get this massive increase in self-awareness, a very critical kind, which Bella calls second order thinking. And what that means is people become very self-critical, very self-aware. And they start to attribute a lot of the suffering. They used to think the suffering in the world was just a natural part of the world, like lightning and thunder. And the gods were just another natural force. The gods aren't moral agents in the Bronze Age. They're just, they're, they're kind of jerks. They just do whatever they want. And they're, they're just natural forces of violent, of chaos and some are order, right? And all that. But then people start to realize, oh, wait, how I'm thinking is a cause of a lot of the suffering, a lot of the violence. The way the mind makes meaning really shapes reality. And so what people start to do is they start to see the world around them as a world that's a world of illusion or deception or decadence or suffering. But they also become aware that they can get better. They can self-transcend. And so they mythologically project a world above or beyond in time, this world, this upper world, right? And so that's the real world. And that's the world where we are free. We, we, we are free from all this self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. And we, are, we come into a fullness of being and we see reality as it is. And we are seen as we truly are. And we are connected to others. It, it's heaven. It's paradise. It's, it, it's, it's the promised land. It, 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 it's the pearl, pearl of immortality. But you get, and so all, many of the world's religions are born at this time because they bring this, they bring this mythos of the two worlds and the, and the wisdom that will liberate us from this decadent world and bring us to the true world. And so this is sown into our way of thinking, our way of being, our way of understanding. And we have all these world religions that created all these ecologies of practices for helping us ameliorate the self-deception and afford the self-transcendence. But they were, in, they were woven into this two worlds mythology. And then what happens is you get a series of things that happened in the late Middle Ages. The, so you get the Renaissance, you get the Scientific Revolution, the Protestant Reformation. And basically we start a process, and I go into this in great detail, but I'm doing it very quickly, in which that two worlds mythology is completely undermined. It's mm. completely undermined. Um, and so we no longer have a worldview mythos that gives us language that we find acceptable, relevant to us, because that, that way of thinking, that way and that language was bound to a two worlds mythology that is really, really undermined. Um, and that's why there's a lot of battles right now between people who are naturalists and supernaturalists. These are sort of the vanguard battles of people trying to, no, there are two worlds, there are two worlds. And, you know, and then there's, uh, there's just a tremendous success of science and secularism and also the tremendous errors of science and sec secularism, but I'll get into that maybe later. The point is, to try and summarize it, is we increasingly have a scientific worldview that doesn't have the two worlds, and it's even worse than that. We don't fit into the scientific worldview. World, world we haven't, science gives us this wonderful explanation 
of a lot of things, but you know what it doesn't do? It doesn't generate an explanation of us, how we make the meaning and how we actually do science. We don't have an explanation of that. We don't have a good explanation of how we make meaning, how we realize truth, how we make meaning in life, how theoretical meaning and meaning, we don't fit into that scientific mm -hmm. worldview, right? And, and spirituality doesn't fit into that scientific worldview because the spirituality has this two worlds, otherworldly mythology attached to it that doesn't fit. And so people are, and so we vacillate. We vacillate between sort of a decadent romanticism in which we say, no, the two, there really is magic. There really is a supernatural and, this, and scientific despair. No, it's all just atoms in the void, nihilism, and there's no meaning. And the spirituality stuff is all just bullshit. And so we vacillate between those two narratives and both of them cut us and undermine us and we suffer. So that's sort of the gist of it. Wow. And the, you, one of the things you were saying in the series is that our grammar reflects this two worlds mythology. Um, but we're living with, with now, we've, we've got a myth, mythos now that is completely um, divorced from that. And that gets us into, that's a cause of suffering as well. Is that fair to say? Yes. I mean, I think, so when we say grammar, I mean your cultural cognitive grammar. What I mean is... The, this conceptual vocabulary, this theoretical grammar for how we make sense of things and how it's woven. And your example of how are you, just how that's, that's a, that's a very superficial example of like a grammar that's woven into how we interact, how we think about things, how we experience ourselves, how we experience the world. Uh, but what we've had, right, what we have is, I don't even know if I would call it a mythos now. It, it's, may, it's more like a mythia. It's a lack of mythos. Uh, because what I think a mythos should do is it should ground your ecologies of practices that are designed for overcoming self-deception, affording meaning in life. Your, your ecology of practices, sorry, I forgot to turn my phone off. Uh, your ecology of practices that's designed basically to cultivate wisdom. It should home that, right? It, it should say, these are why these practices make sense given our best understanding of reality. And we don't have that right now. I think we have the real, so the positive news is, I think we're getting to a place where we could make that now. We really, and that's the project I'm engaged in. But I think in general, uh, the scientific worldview, and I'm a scientist, so I believe in the scientific worldview. I wanna make that very clear, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not like science is the source of all evil. That's not the case, is that, we got into a cultural cognitive grammar where we thought we could, if you allow me a bit of a slogan, we could cultivate wisdom by accumulating knowledge. And that didn't work. And what's happened is even the accumulation of knowledge has now degenerated into just the amassing of information and the hope that, you know, just having more and more information somehow will give us the missing meaning will give us the way to cultivate wisdom. And so that's what I mean when I think it's more like a myth. A, uh, we're in a myth here. There was a book actually written entitled that. I can't remember the author's name. So we, we have this powerful way of gaining knowledge. Um, and it's under threat because of the rise of bullshit, the ways in which, right, we are just awash in um, information that hasn't been properly processed to be knowledge. And we have connections that are maladaptive, malfunctioning connections that just exacerbate our self-deceptive behavior and really cut us off from each other. Look at how cut off we are from each other. The, the media is actually cutting us off from each other such that we're taking to the streets and yelling at each other and, uh, and it's becoming violent and like, um, and as that's been happening, that knowledge project has suppressed, um, often denigrated, neglected, or ignored the wisdom project. And we used to have sort of a deal in our culture. You know, we'd have the science over here, and then people would do religion over here. Uh, and that was the me meaning and wisdom thing. And then here's the science, the knowledge thing, the knowledge and technology thing. And we were just going to go along. And that was sort of the, you know, the post-World War II model. 
And the thing is, it's just, that is just complete. Well, you, I don't have to even argue this. That's completely collapsing. Um, and um, so I think we're in a place where we're, we're suffering a wisdom famine, a meaning crisis. Um, and that's, that's also just reverberating backwards and it's even starting to undermine the knowledge project, the scientific project in powerful ways. Sorry, that sounds like a mess, but um, that sounds like really dark news. But like I said, I think what's happening, that the, the, the science that's the science of how we make meaning in us, that's cognitive science. Um, and that's, that's going through this major, almost like a revolution right now in which we could do what I said, and it's already happening. We could really start to understand the meaning making process in such a way that we could rigorously and even scientifically explain and valorize and legitimate the ecologies of practices for cultivating meaning and flourishing and wisdom. That's what's that's the very, very positive news that I'm trying to bring people right now. Not just me, lots of people are trying to bring it out. Um, so it, we're in sort of very dire circumstances, but we all we there there is good reason and evidence to be hopeful of a possible response. Okay, cool. Um, all right, sorry that was very long, but uh. no, no, it makes sense. Um, so now I want to talk a bit about one of my favorite lectures from the series was the one on Plato. Um, yeah, yes. Some yes. some of the some of the ideas there, um, particularly you know, his model of the psych being divided into three, three kind yep. of key, key elements and also the cave metaphor and the Neoplatonism and why that's, why that's an important thing to, to be aware of in, in modern life. Okay. Well, that, <laughs> you're asking questions that are, are, they're good and they're huge. Um, so I would, I would initially recommend people to the work of Arthur Vers Lewis, uh, cause he has a whole series of books. Um, uh, two that come to mind are uh, perennial philosophy, which is not the Aldous Huxley idea, uh, and uh, platonic mysticism, the Gnostic state. Uh, but what Verse Lewis basically argues is the platonic, neoplatonic tradition is basically the spiritual grammar of the West. Now, I know many people are going to, ah, right? They're going to know Christianity. And I, like, give me a chance. What you have to understand is very early on, you can see it even in St. Paul when he's at the Areopagus and he's quoting Stoic philosophy, which got absorbed into Neoplatonism. You see it in other people like Justin Martyr. And you see it overwhelmingly in Augustine and Dionysus. The point I'm trying to make is that Christianity basically absorbed Neoplatonism. And, and in fact, it's even, it's even that, that is undeniable um, for like if you look at Eastern Orthodox Christianity, it's so Neoplatonic, they like through and through and through and through, read the works of Maximus and, right? Okay, so, and then the same thing, like uh, if you look at, like within Islam and you, you look at the Sufi tradition, this, they even talk about Plotinus, the great Neoplatonist, and, and, and it's so rich with Neoplatonism. Same thing with a lot of Jewish mystical traditions like the Kabbalah and things like that. So. I'm not dismissing them. I'm saying that what they have a shared ancestor that they absorbed into their family uh, of practices, right? And that's Neoplatonism. And Neoplatonism also carried on until about 600 uh, CE, just on its own as a pagan practice. And there's also deep connections between other underground currents, like between Gnosticism and Neoplatonism and Hermeticism. And I'm not saying these are all great systems. I'm just saying that the degree to which it was forced underground, it didn't die. It just proliferated underground. And a lot of occult practices, you can see them as sort of degenerate versions of Neoplatonism. So I think Vers Lewis is, you know, absolutely right about uh, this. So, so, so I'm not saying we can go back to Platonism or even Neoplatonism because Neoplatonism takes, is still within that two worlds mythology. But what I'm saying is we have to somehow recover. I like this word, uh, Kerry uses it in his book on Augustine, it's inventio, it's the Latin word inventio. And inventio means both to discover and to make. So I've coined this new word, reinventio. We have to reinventio Neoplatonism so it is, can fit in 
with our scientific worldview. But that's not a that's not a hard thing to do, like it because a lot of the people that were deeply influential, like um, in the 20th century, and John Spencer and other peoples have argued this in this in you know in, in that in, in you know the invention of uh, uh, the most recent version of the scientific world, people like that are associated with relativity and quantum mechanics and all that. Many of these guys were literally Neoplatonists and deeply influenced by it. There's a book called The Eternal Law where John Spencer just does that history and said, look, Neoplatonism didn't go away. And these people, that, that, that whole scientific revolution that in the 20th century was deeply in, inspired and influenced by a Neoplatonic vision. So there's a reason for all of that. Okay, so what's the, what's, what, what is that and how can we recover it? So Plato had this really powerful idea and we keep rediscovering it. Freud rediscovers it. And, and then now we're rediscovering it in cognitive psychology that the psyche is divided into sort of three different systems. That's not even quite the right word, but these are ways in which the world is apprehended, comprehended, and, and, they're, and, they're, and then thereby a center of motivation. So there's a part of us, um, well, we should do what both Freud and Plato did, and also what modern thinkers like Stanovich do, we can see how the, the parts of the psyche by seeing the psyche in conflict. You can sort of see the parts when you when we're in, in internal conflict. By the way, internal conflict is really important because a lot of our self-deceptive behavior is actually driven by internal conflict. And that was actually Plato's great insight. He was trying to understand why do people fall into self-deception? It's because they have these internal conflicts. So you know, I'll, give, I'll give one of my favorite examples of this right? Um, which is, you know, I want to lose some weight. And so, yeah, I'm going to lose some weight. And then, you know, think about that. That's a, that's a long-term goal. That's very abstract, right? Um, and so I come home and there's a chocolate cake on the counter. Uh, whoa, man, do I want that chocolate cake, right? There's a part of me that just says, it doesn't care about something abstract and long-term like health. It sees, you know, this, right? The, 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 the chocolate and it can smell the cake. It can almost taste uh, and the chocolate. Uh, eat it now, eat it now, eat it now. And, you know, and, and that has an adaptive function uh, and it's very compelling. Now there's another part of me, there's the part that's going, no, don't eat it because you want health. But that part seems really weak, right? It seems like, yeah that's off there in the distance. It, you know, this is why we procrastinate. Yeah, I should write my essay, but that's not for two weeks, right? And, right, right. and so, and again, these, these are all adaptive machines. And that's the thing that cognitive science can show us. It can show, well, why do we behave this way? These are all very adaptive things. Um, but there's a third part. So Plato said, imagine that, that the part that wants the cake, it's like in your stomach or your genitalia, because that's where those really powerful urges, those short-term powerful urges, pleasure and pain, right? And then there's this thing that's like, it's in your head, right? And it's whispering, yes, but health, long-term health, right? And it's like, well, no, it, it's, it's not motivated by pleasure and pain is mattered by truth and falsity. I know that it's true, but knowing that it's true doesn't seem strong enough. And then Plato said, we're lucky. We have a third part of us. And it's like in our chest, right? And this is, this is the fact that we're social cultural beings that in addition to having a biology, we are encultured. We've been talking about that all, all, already today. And so this isn't pain and pleasure, but it's also not truth and falsity. It's honor and belonging or rejection and shame, right? And we really want, you're nodding when I'm talking, right? Because we want to connect, we want to belong, we want to fit to, because one of our greatest adaptations is the fact that we can cooperate and work together. That is our greatest adaptation. And so he, he compared the, the thing in your head to like a man. Uh, I know that's somewhat sexist, but compared to the people of his time, Plato is like really, really um, challenging sexist attitudes, because he thought women could also rule, be philosophers, be in the army, which was rarely, very countercultural. But anyways, the thing in your head is like a man, the thing in your head is, is like, a, like a lion, because they're social animals, and we associate them with pride. That's why we even call it a pride of lions, right, and stuff like that. At least I think so. And then the thing in your stomach is like a monster, right? Mm. 
So he says, now what do we do when we want to change? Now we get into self-deception because the monster make things, makes things really salient to us, but disconnects us from caring about whether or not they're true or not. And may even cause us to not pay proper attention to other people, right? And that's the root of self-deception. Self-deception is when these adaptive machineries are out of sync such that we find stuff salient in a way that's not tracking our responsibilities to other people or our responsibility to the truth. In fact, that's Frankfurt's, that's kind of Frankfurt's definition of bullshit. The liar tells you something that's false and that's how they try to change your behavior. But the bullshit artist tries to get the monster running independent of the lion and the man. And that's how they manipulate you. That's self -dece that's deception. And you can bullshit yourself. You can't really lie to yourself. That doesn't make any sense, but you can bullshit yourself. You can just let your, yes, my attention goes to the chocolate cake and that makes it even more salient. And then my attention keeps coming back to the chocolate cake and that makes it more salient until I can't see anything but the chocolate cake and then I'm eating it before I even realize it. So that we bullshit ourselves. And then Plato said, okay, we, we bullshit ourselves and we self-deceive and we don't properly treat others and we don't properly care for the truth. How do we get, because these things are out of alignment, how do we get them into alignment? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, well, the man can at least learn the truth, right? But what can the man do? Well, the man can actually train the lion. And then the lion is, the man and the lion can tame the monster. And it's this wonderful metaphor and you think, well, what does Plato mean? Well, and, and he's right. If you want to change a habit, join a group. If you want to change a habit, join AA, join Weight Watchers. If you want to do meditation, stick with a group for at least a year, and then you'll be able to meditate on your own. If you only, if you start meditating on your own, 90% of the time, you'll have stopped meditating within five weeks, right? Mm -hmm. So Plato's bang on right about that. So how do we get the man to teach the line? Well, what we do is we try to set up a group practice in which we're honoring each other in a shared commitment to the truth, right? Mm -hmm. That way the lion is getting us to pay attention to what the man is saying. You and I work together, right? And that's, his, that's Plato's practice of dialectic. That's what I'm trying to, right? When I'm trying to you know, re re revitalize for today right now, how can we enter into dialogos so that together we are leaving bullshit and coming insights together, sharing together, creating together insights that we can't get on our own so that we can afford each other's transformation so that we can more and more listen to the reality and the truth of things. That's the process of dialectic. And then what Plato says, if you're doing the practice of dialectic and it's getting you into dialogos, what happens is all three of these get into a proper alignment. So they're all living as much as they can without harming the other two. They get into a mutual optimal existence. And he said that is, and we have a meta drive more than more like in addition to whatever we desire, we desire the fulfillment of our desires to bring us inner peace, peace of mind, this fullness of being, right? We want that. But Plato said, we also have another desire, a meta drive. We want that whatever satisfies our desires to be real. That's why you can ask people, I do this in a classroom. I say, how many of you are in really good romantic relationships? Yes. You know, those people. Of those people, how many of you would want to know that your partner was cheating on you, even if it meant the destruction of the relationship? Almost everybody puts their hand up again. They'll destroy this thing because it's not real, mm -hmm. right? It's not real. And so Plato says, well, notice what happens. As you do the process that brings you inner peace, it reduces the inner conflict, it reduces the bullshitting, and therefore, and that, that in and of itself is just inherently valuable, but it also reduces our self-deception. It reduces our self-deception and it gets us to care about the truth and care about our responsibility to other people more appropriately, more, in, more proportionately. And so what do we do? We connect to the world better. We start to see the real patterns better in the world. And that's satisfying. That really satisfies us. We really want that. We want to be in touch with things, listen to the language. But as we see those real patterns and connect to other people, that allows us to reflect better on ourselves, right? And see our own psyches better and see the real patterns 
in us. And that helps us even better reduce the self-deception. And then this, as we reduce the self-deception, we get more connected to reality. And you see what happens? It loops. And the two things mutually afford each other. So these two meta desires of inner peace and contact with what's real, and that means real contact with the reality of other people, right? They're being mutually satisfied in a mutually accelerating manner. And when, when you get that, by the way, think about when you're falling in love, you open up, you sort of get a little bit of a, that alignment in yourself and you open up to another person and that helps them align. And then they open up to you, right? And you see them a little more clearly and they help you see yourself a little more clearly. And then you open up to them and they open up to you and you do this reciprocal opening and you fall in love. And what Plato is basically saying is, if you do this right, you can fall in love with reality. And that means also other people as, as real persons. And that is a process he calls anagogy. This is the process. And he tells the story of people coming out of a cave, right? And that's the story of people going through this. Op it's, a myth it's a mythological, metaphorical way of describing people going through this reciprocal opening process and falling in love with, with simultaneously and not in an egocentric way with the depths of their psyche and the depths of reality in a mutually affording way. And Plato says, Plato's argument is, that's, that's, that, that's, that's the wisest, most meaningful possible life available to people. Now he tells this two world story, people are trapped in a cave underground and they have to go up to an other world, uh, the real world where the sun is shining and there's light and life. And it's a beautiful story and it's all, and it's part of the two worlds mythology. And, you know, and, and I, and Plato's beautiful and I love it. Uh, Plato has a profound influence on me. But we don't need this story anymore because we have the cognitive science and I'm even doing it with you now that says, yes, we understand how and why all of this is working. And so we don't have to, we can talk about anagoge, we can talk about reciprocal opening, we can talk about the alignment of the psyche, we can talk about picking up on real patterns, we can talk about overcoming self-deception, we can talk about flourishing, we can talk about all of that using the language of cognitive science. And so we don't have to use a language of trapped here and they're up a, a world up there. We don't, we don't have to use that language anymore. It's beautiful language. And we, I'm not saying throw away the art, keep the art, keep the art. Don't do that. Don't throw it away. But what I'm saying is we have another way of thinking about it that can sow that spiritual quest, right? Back into the scientific worldview. Very cool. Very cool. Well, John, there's about a million things I could ask you. Um, we've only got 10 <laughs> minutes left, so I'm trying to figure out what's, what would be best to ask. Um, I think one of the concepts I find really interesting as well was this idea of existential inertia and the work of yeah. L.A. Paul. I find yeah. that very interesting and also serious play, too. Could you maybe tell us a bit more about that and why that's important? Well, and that, that's, actually, that's actually integral to this... Um, this the journey that we talked about, the anagage, right? Um, the, the, the mythological coming out of the cave, right? The, and the point is, in pe you have to read the whole story. You ascend out of the cave, you see the sun, and then you return back into the cave to try and set the people free that are still there. It's not just about having a wonderful experience. It's about transforming yourselves and other people. Um, so that transformation is really key. And so, and L.A. Paul, Lori, I know her, I've met her. Um, I talked to her. Uh, I went down to Yale and uh, lectured in one of her classes. Uh, she invited me. Brilliant thinker. She literally wrote the book on transformative experience. It's entitled Transformative Experience. And she, she, she does what philosophers do really well, what, what the, why we need them. They, she takes something that we're aware of and she reveals what's problematic about it. And we, we, why do you do that? Because there's a lot of stuff that we don't understand and we're bullshitting ourselves if we're attached to something. I want transformation. Well, what is it? Well, I don't know. Well, that's bullshit. Like you're bullshitting yourself. You're, something is salient to you, but you don't really understand it. And so she, she makes the process of transformation very problematic in order to bring out a deeper understanding of what's involved in it. And she does this by doing what philosophers do, often do. She tells a thought experiment. Right, they point, what is the thought experiment is sort of crafted to make an obvious point 
in a non-controversial situation and then you are supposed to transfer it back to real life. So let me do it with you, right? And she says, so this happens to you. Your friends come to you and they give you incontrovertible evidence, just absolutely rigorous argument that they can turn you into a vampire. Okay. Should you do it? And she says, well, notice there's a problem here you face, which is you may have all kinds of propositions because that's what they're giving about a vampire. Um, so you, you, have, you, 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 know, you, can, you can have all kinds of beliefs, but that's really, really inadequate for making your decision because you're lacking a, a couple of important kinds of knowledge, right? So you, you don't know what it's, like, what it's going to be like to be a vampire. Now notice how that's different from having all these propositions about a vampire that you believe. Now, what does she mean? Well, this is what I call perspectival knowing. And I've done this with Laurie and she sort of says, yeah, that's, that's what I mean. So you know what it's like to be you right here, right now. You're in a particular state of mind and you have a particular perspective. This is how things feel to you, how they look to you, how they appear to you, right? How they're salient to you and it's constantly shifting. And, 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 and that's, that's enmeshed with the state of mind you're in. You'd have a different perspective if you were drunk, for example, or if you were really tired, or if you were in psychological distress, different things would stand out to you as important and your sense of self and identity would be altered, right? Uh, so that's your perspectival knowing. It's knowing what it is like to be you here now, right? From the inside, to have a perspective. You don't know what it's like to be a vampire. You don't have that perspectival knowing, right? Because you have to be a vampire. And that takes us to the second part. And this is what I call participatory knowing. This is knowing by the kind of identity you assume and the kind of identities you assign to things in the world. So for example, right now, I'm sort of a scientist and you're an interviewer, right? Obviously you're much more than that. And hopefully you acknowledge I'm much more than a scientist, right? But that's the role, right? That's the role we're shaping, we're shaping each other to each other so that these roles fit together and there's affordances for communication between us. That's our participatory knowing. And that's, that has to do with what we're identifying with, what we're deeply valuing, right? And how we're engaging in all of that. And, and you don't have participatory knowing of, of, of being a vampire because you've never had the identity of a vampire. You don't know what, so you can't use your current identity and values to judge the identity and values of the vampire because you don't know those and you don't you aren't that identity and you don't identify with those values so she says you're completely ignorant you don't know what the probabilities are going to be you don't know what the values are going to be so you can't and you can't infer your way through it there's no there there's no inference right there, because you're ignorant of you know the perspectival and the participatory knowing you're completely ignorant and the thing is, it's symmetrical ignorance. If I don't do it, I don't know what I'm missing. And if I do do it, if I decide to do it, I don't know what I'm gonna lose. So how do you do it, right? How do you do it? You can't reason your way through it. You can't infer your way through it. And yet we do this all the time. And that's LA Paul, that's Lori's point. Because you do it when you decide to have a kid. You don't know what it's, you don't know the identity of being a parent. Being a child, does not give you any idea, that's even the wrong word, doesn't give you any sense of what it is to be a parent. And if you think, you know, you don't realize how egocentric your perspective is until you have a child, because you can't be the center. Your whole salience landscape has to shift and the it has to be about the child more than it's about you. You don't know what it's like going to be like. You don't know what you're missing if you never have a child, but you don't know before having a child what you're going to lose. You can talk to people like me and I can give you all kinds of propositions because I've had kids, but you don't know. You, you're going to be a different person and you're going to you're going to have different perspectival and di different participatory knowing. And the problem is once you've done it, like, whoa, whoa you can't go back, right? You're going to enter into a romantic relationship. You're going to be a different person. You're gonna have a different perspective. You, your perspectival and participatory knowing are gonna be different. And you won't, you won't know that until after you're in the relationship and the relationship has changed you and you see the world differently and you are in that world differently. And you say, well, I can get out of the romantic relationship. Yeah, you can, but man, that's really painful, right? Yeah, right. So what do we do? And that's just like deciding to move to a new culture taking up a new career, 
entering university in the hopes of going becoming a different person at the other end. All of these are examples of those kinds of decisions. So what do we do? And again, I've actually proposed this to Lori in person. Um, well, let's take the example of deciding whether or not you want to have a kid. You know what people do? What I've seen a lot of people do is they'll get a dog and they'll treat the dog, they'll name the dog and the pictures taking with the dog and they, they treat the dog like a child, but it's not a child, right? And this is what I call serious play. What you do is you put yourself in a place where you're pretending, not in the sense of lying, but the way a child can pretend a, sick, a stick is a sword mm -hmm. or that when they're jumping off a, a couple of stairs, they're flying through the air like Superman. We, and why do children play? They play because they, it gives them a taste of what another perspective is that they don't yet have and what, a, a, what an identity is that they don't yet have. This is what Agnes Collard calls aspiration. It allows them to aspire to a new way of seeing and a new way of being. That's why children play. It's, it's a, it, that's how we develop. But we play as adults. We do serious, and children's play is serious play, by the way. We've confused the fact that things are pleasurable with them being trivial, right? So adults, they get a dog. So what they do is they enter this, they enter this space that's, they haven't left the world of uh, not having kids and they haven't fully entered the world of having parents. They're in this liminal zone where they're seriously playing so they can taste what it would be like to have a child. But if it's not working, they can pull back and say, and they just have a dog and they could even, you know, maybe give the dog away. And that might hurt them for a day or two emotionally, but then it's gone. And nobody will say what, but like, but if you tried to do that with your kid, oh my gosh, right? So they, right, they do serious play or they, right? And, and I've heard people actually give this advice, a serious romantic relationship. Well, go on a, go on, but this is pre-COVID, of course. Go on a trip with a person. Go on a trip for a couple of weeks. Live with them for two weeks. But because it's a trip, it's out there and it's, it's play, right? It's serious play. It's not for real because you're not actually bound into your life, but you're actually living together, but you're not, right? And it's all this. And then, and then, so you seriously play and you get a taste of what it would be like to live with this person. And you see if you're compatible right, and et cetera, we do serious play. And here's something I wanna say, and it is not meant to be an insult, because I take seriously what the children are doing. I teach developmental psychology. Religion was serious play. Religion is, and again, I mean this as a compliment. You go into this building, it's a special place for play. It's a church perhaps, or a mosque, right? And we go in there. And we pretend a lot of things, again, not in the sense of lying or self-deception, but in the sense of the child trying to, what would it be like to be Jesus? And we seriously play, at what would it be like to be Jesus? What would it be like to be one of his disciples? How would we see things? What kind of identity would we have? How would we do it individually? How would we do it together? And we play with that and we taste it. And if, and if, it, and if it catches, we start to take it out of the play zone back into our lives. And that's how we engage in transformative experience. And that's what we want our religions ultimately to do for us. We think that religions are ultimately about the beliefs. That's like the person who thinking the beliefs about a vampire are sufficient for being a vampire. The beliefs are only there, I would argue, and this will get me into trouble, but they're only there to, to help afford the serious play. But unless you're doing the serious play, you're not gonna actually find the transformation. Hmm. Now, the thing that you have to ask yourself, if you ask the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, why don't they belong to an established religion? They don't say because I think everything they say is false. They could say that, but they don't say that. They say they find it, and this is the key, they find it irrelevant. They can't play that. It's like, you know, you were a kid, right? And you used to play with toys. Like I remember when my younger son was younger, he had all these 
figurines from the, the Justice League. And here's Martian Manhunters, here's Superman, here's Batman. And he would play and he'd ask me to play with him and I would sort of play with him. And there was a difference between how he was playing with him and, and I, like, I can't play with them. I really wanted to, but I even remember that moment as a kid where I got out all my toys and I, and I you know, as you know, 10 or 11, and I'm getting out all my toys and I'm putting them on the table and I was like, I start to play with them and it's just, it doesn't catch. It just doesn't catch. I can't do the serious play anymore. Somehow my development is pa had passed on. I'm not saying we've outgrown religion. That, that would be really insulting. The point I'm trying to make with my analogy is it's not a case of disbelief. It's a case that for some reason, right? Those places, we, people can't seriously play in them anymore. They can't find the transformation they're seeking. I think it has to do with the historical reasons we've been talking about. I think that's why churches are no longer the serious play zones they used to be for many, many people. Cool. Well, John, I think that's all we've got time for, but I just want to say a huge thank you for the work that you're doing and for taking some time today to share some of your knowledge with that I, or share some of your knowledge with us. I really, really appreciate it. Um, where can people um, follow up on this conversation? Where can they find you online? Where would you recommend people to go? Well, I mean, I recommend people check out the lecture series we've been talking about, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. That's on YouTube. And then I recommend they take, they, uh, they take a look at Voices with Raveki, where I'm engaging with other people in the serious play of dialectic into dialogos that I was talking about, where I'm really trying to explore it, reinventio it, participate in it, exemplify it, share it with other people. And so the Voices with Raveki, um, video, videos come out on that uh, weekly. If you're interested in sort of deeper questions about consciousness, uh, take a look at uh, Untangling the World Knot that I did with my friend and colleague, Greg Enriquez. Um, if you're interested about this, what the self is now, what, what, what is the self? Uh, I have a new series that's coming out very shortly called The Elusive Eye, like the letter I, uh, right? Uh, the nature and function of the self. Uh, and then there's going to be uh, another major series, hopefully coming out. Yeah, I'm hoping if COVID lets up by September of, of this year called After Socrates, uh, the cultivation of wisdom through authentic dialogue. Um, uh, there's a book I have out, you mentioned it, you know, the zombie, that's for free, by the way, open book publishers, zombies in Western culture, a 21st century crisis. And hopefully the, the anthology on dialectic and dialogos, it's called Inner and Outer Dialogues, that should hopefully be published and available later this year. So those are things to look for and to look forward to. Um, if people are interested in uh, pr pursuing some of this uh, more fully. If you really want to start engaging in cultivating an ecology of practices, so during COVID, between sort of April, no, March and December, I ran an online meditation and contemplation course, and then I followed that with a cultivation of wisdom course. All of those videos are also that those both of those courses and they overlapped and connect are all available online. Uh, we, we filmed it daily. There's lessons, there's practice, there's Q&A sessions. That's all available also on YouTube if you want to uh, engage in some of these, begin to engage in some of these transformative practices. Fantastic. Well, we'll link to those in the show notes uh, after the episode. So, John, thanks again. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you, and I wish you the best of luck going forward. Thank you, Niall. It was really great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much.